Welcome to the Reading Initiative for Student Excellence, RISE, Informational Video Series, The Science of Reading, Part 1, presented by the Arkansas Department of Education. Before we begin, let's consider some important questions about reading instruction. When did American society begin to expect that everyone should be able to read? The answer, in the 1920s, with the passage of compulsory public education laws. Question two, what percentage of adults in the U.S. is functionally illiterate? The answer, 22% to 25%. And question three, what percentage of children referred to special education has learning disabilities involving reading and or language? The answer, approximately 80% to 85%. The remaining portion of this video shares some important statistics about the literacy crisis in the United States and provides specific current research that has strong implications for professional practice. In sizing up reading problems in the United States, we find that 11% to 17% of children have reading disabilities. This is according to the work of Sally Shaywitz in 2003 in her book, Overcoming Dyslexia. Nationally, between 36% to 38% of fourth grade children are below basic in reading, according to the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And more than 70% of high poverty minority children are at risk and score below basic. The current reality in Arkansas is equally startling. 31% of fourth grade students in Arkansas are proficient in reading. 27% of eighth grade students in Arkansas are proficient in reading. 48.6% of third through 10th grade students are proficient in English language arts. 39% of graduating seniors in Arkansas met reading readiness benchmarks. Too many children are not learning to read. NAEP and the ACT Aspire provide a clear picture of student academic progress in Arkansas over time. When we think about best practices for the state of Arkansas as well as for the United States, we must base those practices on scientific research. Well thought out hypotheses that build on prior knowledge, studies that are replicable, use of well defined and large enough subject samples, use of qualitative and quantitative methods as appropriate, and findings that are subject to peer review before publication. We must think about a hypothesis as being derived from previous research and observation. When we consider scientific research, we must think about the importance of it being replicable. The population, the materials, and the design must be thoroughly described. Also, the quantitative and qualitative measures must be considered. Quantitative research applies objective pre-planned statistical analysis and uses measures that produce numerical data. Qualitative methods utilize surveys, interviews, and anecdotal information. Both have a place in scientific studies. However, it's generally agreed that quantitative research is necessary for making inferences about cause and effect. And finally, peer-reviewed articles ensure that study design, implementation, outcomes and interpretations are subjected to critical analysis. Research informs instruction. Research has already provided substantial answers to questions such as, how do children learn to read? Which skills are most critical? And at what points during reading development? What causes reading difficulty in most students? At what ages? Are there practices, programs, and methods that work best for most students? or students with specific weaknesses. We must realize that the emphasis of a personal philosophy in, in choosing reading programs should be behind us. We must make a shift from using tradition and intuition to looking at research for best practice. We are much farther ahead in reading research than we are in other areas of education. We are beginning to make connections between the findings of neuroscience and best practices in the classroom. For example, we have more research now about reading and its instruction 
than we have about writing and mathematics. Some of the summaries of scientific reading research can be found in the report of the National Reading Panel, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and this can be found at nationalreadingpanel.org, Preventing Reading Difficulties in Young Children at the National Academy of Sciences, The Voice of Evidence in Reading Research by Brooks Publishing, The Psychological Science in the Public Interest, and the Handbook of Language and Literacy. Professionals know the scientific truths from which their practice is developed. These texts present current findings, but there's still a lot we don't know. A great deal of reading research is being done to answer the many questions that remain, especially regarding the area of comprehension. Keeping current is a lifelong professional task. There are many current journals to be cited. These are just a few. Some examples of journals with scientific reading research include the Scientific Studies of Reading, the Journal of Learning Disabilities, Reading and Writing, Research Quarterly, Journal of Educational Psychology, Annals of Dyslexia, Contemporary Educational Psychology, and Developmental Psychology. These major journals may be out of reach for many teachers because those who do the research and contribute the results of these studies to journals tend to publish for their peers, not for practitioner use. Therefore, it's not surprising that the body of knowledge underlying scientifically based reading research is unfamiliar to many educators or that it seems difficult to interpret. Keeping up with the research is very important. To do so means reading text and information that is available to the practitioner. These include some of the most recent text available regarding the reading research. Kilpatrick's book, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties, is a great piece to begin reading. It will certainly change your mind about best practices for effective reading instruction. Mark Seidenberg's book, Language at the Speed of Sight, was released earlier this year, and Daniel Willingham's book, The Reading Mind, a cognitive approach to understanding how the mind reads was also released in May of 2017. Many insights are coming to us in the field of neuroscience and linguistics about how the brain learns to read. This information is relevant to our classroom practices. We hope that you will enjoy looking for these texts at your library or online, and we hope that these will be beneficial to you as you practice and improve in the classroom. Thank you.